day. Yep. Today is the last study in Hebrews for a little while. We're going to conclude the book of Hebrews this morning and uh, get to share with you the one of my favorite benedictions of all of the New Testament letters is found in this wrap-up of this book today. And so I'll show you why in just a minute, but um, I want to encourage you as we look into God's Word, there's things that His Spirit can speak to us and impart to us uh, things that strengthen our faith. Amen. That's what I pray happens today for you as we look at this benediction. Since we don't know exactly who the author of Hebrews is, there's a lot of speculation, although in the early church, all the way, I told you last week, until 300 AD, um, the book of Hebrews is always attributed to Paul. And uh, in the groupings of your Bible, I don't know if you ever noticed this in the New Testament, but um, the Bible starts off with the Gospel of Matthew, and then the Gospel of Mark, Gospel of Luke, and then the Gospel of John. And uh, so those are written by four different authors in the New Testament, and uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John Mark, that was uh, the guy, that, the young man that went with Paul on his first missionary journey, and then later they parted ways because he didn't want to go again. He got a little nervous. He's a young boy at that time, remember, but he wrote some neat things, and he, uh, he, you know, so we have those four authors, and then the book of Acts, which is I call Luke 2, just in case you don't know, Luke is the author, the one that authored the Gospel of Luke, said, I wrote to you the first, the Gospel of Luke, and then I wrote to you this, this, uh, second letter that I'm writing and the first letter was all that Jesus did when he was on earth what he began and did in his public ministry and then the second letter the book of Acts he says is all that he did um, through his spirit as he was taken up into heaven before the disciples that's the opening of the book of Acts is Jesus is there on the hillside and um, he gets taken up right in their sight can you just picture I don't know about you but if I could you know some of the times People say, if you had a time machine, where would you go? You know, what would you like to see? And I thought, you know, seeing Jesus um, ascend right into heaven and have heaven, oh, it says that heaven's opened and that he was received right in their sight. Now it says that they stood there with their jaws just uh, unhinged in the Greek. It just, you know, they were, they were like, and the angels spoke to them and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here gawking or gazing so intently in English, they say? Because don't you know that this, this Jesus, which you have just seen, be taken up into heaven? And we always, some people picture heaven really far away. I don't think it is. I think it's just masked behind a, a curtain that we don't, we don't perceive how close it is. Because if they were able to see the heavens open and Jesus ascend right into heaven, and where did he... He took his seat where? At the right hand of the Father. They got to stare up into heaven and see Jesus take his seat at the right hand of God. They, that means they got to look up and see the heavenly throne. Now, I don't know about you, but if I could go to one of the old New Testament, you know, time machine back, I wouldn't mind standing on the hill with them. My jaw might have fallen down too, but, uh, <laughs> but that just tells you how glorious and awesome heaven is. But the angel spoke and said, Don't you know that in the same manner in which you saw him go, in like manner he will return? And when we look into the book, the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, it says the sky will rent in two, it'll tear like a curtain, and then, voila, what's behind the curtain? You know, I tell the kids, when I used to teach this in Sunday school, I used to say, Just picture a big movie screen on the, you know, curtain on the wall, and all of a sudden someone from behind the curtain takes a sword and cuts it down the middle and and now all of a sudden now now the real thing comes from behind the curtain you know and that's what's going to happen to the sky the sky is going to tear back like a curtain and the same what they saw happen him ascend we'll see him descend but this time he'll come flying on a white horse and down his thigh will say king of kings and what lord of lords and and he'll come back for us and and it's this is this is the i mean well this is pretty exciting stuff, you know. I mean, you think, wow, this is going to be slick that he's going to come. Well, it's actually, some people say, does he come back for us then? I think, well, he comes as a thief in the night. It says we come back with him. So you figure it all out. We got to get there, come back. And um, that's what we're going to That's the entrance that's spoken of in Revelation. The, the grand, I mean, the Lord with his armies behind him. And I look forward to all this. But this is so that, you know, I look at this and I go, well, that's in Acts. 
And mm -hmm. Luke wrote a wonderful uh, epistle that, that tells us all to Theophilus, he was writing, most excellent Theophilus, I write you all these things. And then he tells about all the stuff that happened in the early church with the disciples. How Peter got arrested for preaching, how he got thrown in jail, how the angel of the Lord brought him out of jail. And he went, he didn't even, he thought he was sleepwalking, you know, but he gets out there and uh, he must have been a sleepwalker because he got all the way to the hill before he realized it was real and, and, and that he was really being set free. And, uh, and he gets out. And then, you know, from there we go to the first book of Paul, the apostle, the book of Romans. We learn about his conversion in the book of Acts. But then in your Bible, the grouping goes from these four writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to Paul, the book of Romans. And then we read, that's one of his first epistles. And then, I don't know if you ever noticed this, but the rest of all the, the books to follow, you know, after Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, you know, you, you, you go through all of the, all the epistles that come, all the way to the, the book of Hebrews, what we're saying now, are all written by Paul the Apostle. Okay? And then we're going to, after this, after the book of Hebrews, you'll see there's only a couple small, small epistles before Revelation that we're going to see. You know, James gets his uh, uh, short letter in their sweet power pact, and then P Peter gets his, and, and John, Jude, and then Revelation. So, to let you know, the grouping of the scriptures were grouped by the early, the, the early guys that put together what we call the canon of scripture, and they put the book of Hebrews at the end of all of Paul's writings. As, and, and, and even though it doesn't say his name, it just has clues, and they believe that this was, they, they received, now I, I think they probably knew better than the modern theologians know, but um, I'll just take it on, and it doesn't matter who wrote it, because Peter wrote that all scripture is inspired by who? By God. The Holy Ghost is the one that gives the inspiration, and it's him that we want to listen to. His spirit leads us, his spirit guides us, he teaches us, he brings to our remembrance all that God has spoken to us. So, so don't stress over who wrote this. Rather, I want you to listen to what the author wrote. Because the Holy Ghost gave one of the greatest benedictions to whoever the writer was, in verse 20 and 21. And today I'm going to read you this because of all the benedictions, I mean, I've read all the different endings of all the letters of the New Testament. And this one has one of the greatest power-packed endings. Now, there, uh, there's a couple others that are some of my favorites, personally, because of just certain other details that, you know, when Paul's writing to Timothy, who he called his son in the faith, he gives him some, a benediction that is really sweet, but it's, it's like a father in the faith to a son in the faith, and it's got some really precious things in it, and also some warnings for him, you know, like, mm -hmm. I, you know, in benedictions, because I was raised Italian, the benedictions of a thing were more important than they are in English. I, I, I went, I, in English course, I learned that, you know, when you're writing in writing class, the, the, you put the most important things in two places in, a, in a, any any essay that you write. Where are the two places? The, the beginning and the end. And they're supposed to be the emphasis. You know, you, you, this is what we're going to be studying and then at the end you wrap it up and go over the main points of what you just went and studied. If any good teacher will do that in their course of presenting, they're going to tell you this is what we're going to look at and then you look at it in depth and then they come back and then they the main point is going to be brought back at the end to punctuate it. Now, in Italian culture, when you say your goodbyes and your your benedictions, it's a little bit there. It's more along the lines of the culture that was the days of Jesus. Over there in the Middle Eastern culture, when you said your benedictions, the person was going to speak um, the blessings and the, and the important things that they want you to take away. The most important, even if you didn't read the whole letter, you could skip to the benediction and at least get a super cool blessing. You know, like just, wow, that's a nice blessing to have. So I want you to look at the blessing that was spoken. Now think of this as a blessing. Someone speaking a blessing to you that they want to have come into your life spiritually. This is a blessing for you to, to receive from God. And here's the blessing. Verse 20. Now, he says, the God of peace. Who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you 
in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. This is the blessing spoken to us by the author of Hebrews. Now the end of it will be, and the grace, grace be with you, how, how many of you? All. Grace be with you all. May the grace of God be with you all. That's the most common, and by the way, if you do want to study the benedictions of every letter, I, I submit to you, you will find the grace be with you all in every one of Paul's benedictions. So, just for a commonality, you know, he doesn't ever leave out grace. Why? Well, uh, maybe he was shown grace. Maybe he was one of those guys that was saved by grace and by yet by the grace of God. Here go I, like the old uh, hymn says, you know, not, without grace, I, I wouldn't be in the running. It's by the grace of God that I got in the club. Because the Bible says it's not by works that a man does. It's by grace that God has shown to us. And it's his grace that gives us the strength to go on. And, and if you, you know, if you're not too prideful to acknowledge, yeah, I was a sinner before I came to the Lord, you, you're probably much appreciative of his grace, Amen. like I am. You know, it's like, thank you, Lord, for your grace. Because grace, as it says, is receiving a gift that you didn't merit. It's unmerited favor. You didn't earn it. Like a, like the merit badges I used to earn in Scouts. I had to do certain things to get those little stickers. You know, I had, to, I had to work hard to get the patch for the how to make a fire and how to pitch a camp and how to do... And all of these knot tying and, and all these different fishing and, and different skills. that I had to earn those things. And we're so used to earning everything that it's hard for some Americans to receive the idea that God wants to give you a gift that you can't earn. The only thing you can do is receive it. When he says, here's a present, just like kids, I love, I love that God put me in ministry with children first, not adults. Thank you, Lord. Because when, you t when I would tell kids the stuff of, about the Lord, God loves you and he wants to give you a gift. And they just go, okay, what is it? And their hands are already out. They're like, give it to me. You know, like, like if, if I walked it and... They got it. If I, I, and I used to have a little, one of the aunties used to give me this bucket of candy from Costco back in the day. I mean, and it was, it was a ginormous plastic bin with those little wrapped candies in it and, and that, and, and all assorted. And the kids would, the kids would go, I go, I have a present for you and I put it up on my lap. Who would like one of these? Man, I do, I do, I do, you know. And, and, and I said, well, what do you have to do to get it? And I mean, before I could say anything, the kid would be running up to the, you know, the littlest ones. They don't even wait. They just run up and they, they're, they're like, put their hands up. Me, me, me. Like, and, and, and they're pointing. No, the yellow one. No, the striped one. No, yeah. no. I'm colorblind. It was a pain, but I just like, <laughs> just reach in and get it. But don't take 10, just one, you know, take one. And I'd have to. But I'd let them take it, in, in a, and after they all got a little piece of candy, so what did you have to do to get that? Did you have to earn that? Did I make you do anything? And they're like, nope. um, we had to come up there and get it. <laughs> you know? I'm like, yeah, you had to come up and just get it. It's a gift. You just got to come up and receive. You might have heard of altar calls where the preacher says, anyone want an eternal life, just come up here, mm -hmm. and we're going to pray over you so you can have that gift. That's just like a kid coming up to get the candy. You're coming up to get spiritual candy. The best thing you can get, eternal life. Amen. But to get it, you got to be like a child. And Jesus said it. Unless you become like a child, you can't receive the things of the kingdom of heaven. Because it's that simple. And we want to overcomplicate it with our adult brains and make it really hard. Like we got to do something and do extra. And the author of Hebrews doesn't say you do anything extra. The author of Hebrews actually says it's God who does these things for you. Amen. And it's him as a heavenly father. And I love this first part because, and I'm going to break it down for you now because it says now the God of peace, the God of peace. You know, so many people represent and, and portray God as the God of anger. And, mm -hmm. and he's ticked off. He's mad at you. He's good. He's waiting for you to blow. So he smash you with his thumb and rub you out of existence. I mean, they just, I listen to some preachers and I, if you want to tell what, 
how, how a preacher's really coming across. They say that 97% of all that we communicate is through nonverbal communication. It has nothing to do with the right words because I know God had to have a sense of humor to pick me. My English isn't that good. And he goes, don't worry, I'll use you anyway. But I found that if you want to see what how a preacher really comes across, like maybe you're watching uh, online and you wonder, what's he communicate? Just turn the volume down. Don't listen to the words. Watch the facial expression. Watch the how they communicate non-verbally. Man, I've seen some preacher. The Lord hates you, and He's gonna zap you, and you better repent. You know, what I, mean? Yeah. I mean, that's maybe they don't use those words, but if I turn down the volume, that's what it looks like they're saying. Like God is mad at you, and so am I. <laughs> Listen, I'm not mad at you. I, I I love you in the Lord, and and I want the best for you, just like it says. The author of Hebrews in this blessing is praying for a blessing over you. And let me show you how great this blessing he's praying. He He's praying a blessing that God would equip you in every good thing to do his will. Now, if you leave off that to do his will, which uh, some of these American preachers do, they, God wants to equip you in every good thing. And let me tell you the good things he wants. And, th and then they springboard off of that broken piece of a verse into all of the name it and claim it and health and wealth doctrines that they might want to spin and and and, and they want to make it all about you getting all of the promises and blessings for you yeah. i got news for you he wants to equip you in every good thing for a purpose Amen. and that purpose is to do his will Amen. and whenever you can finally come to the understanding that it's not about doing your will. Just like Jesus when he prayed in the garden. Father, I, I pray you take this cup from me. I don't want to drink it. Let it pass. He says, but nevertheless, not my will, but whose will? Your will be done. When you start coming into an understanding that you surrender, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. And I'm just going to do whatever you say. You're going to come into some freedom spiritually that you've never maybe experienced. Maybe some uh, growth will happen <laughs> in the most positive ways. Whenever you finally sub come and say, you know, God, I just want to do your will. Because God has, the God of peace, has worked this beautiful eternal covenant in the blood of his son Jesus for you. And this is part that, that he did so that he could equip you. And every good thing to do his will. And he's done this in order that it, it would be that, uh, that, you, that he would work, it says, in us, that which is pleasing in his sight. You ever want to be pleasing to the Lord? I know I do. I'm like, Lord, I just want to do what you want me to do and put a smile on your face today. That you would be pleased with whatever it is that I share. That the words that fall from my lips would be what you would want communicated, not... Not what Izzy thinks. But you would be glorified and you, I could steer people to you so that we could all be pleasing in this sight. And if I could get all of us with that goal of, man, I just want to be pleasing in his sight. I want to do whatever he wants me to do. I want to I wanna bring a smile to his face. But when you get to that place in your walk where that's your goal, stuff starts to happen. And people start going, how come you have all these things happen for you? They don't happen for me. And I'm like, uh, let me guess. Are you working for pleasing, doing things that are pleasing in his sight? Or are you working at doing what is pleasing to you? I kind of found out when you try to do the pleasing things to you, <laughs> it doesn't work. It's bad. But when you do things pleasing in his sight, then stuff starts to come together. Then you start going, oh, wow, this is, life becomes good. And you have a backing from the God of peace to help you do this. The one, he, he's the one that will equip you to do these things. Did you know that? It's not up to you to be able to have all of the, all of the qualifications to do things. You know, I, I someone once said, God doesn't call the qualified, he, he, he qualifies the call. Amen. You don't have to be qualified to work for him or to please him. You just got to come to him and say, I'll take the gift of your salvation and your son. And he goes, done. 
Now let me give you what you're going to need for every good thing to do my will. He's going he's gonna to give you every good thing to do his will that you need. So you don't come qualified. You just come as a sinner. And he goes, come here, sinner. I got some stuff for you. Starting with everlasting life through the blood of his son, Jesus. And by the way, those people that get mad at me about talking about blood, don't talk about blood again. It's gory. They're freaking me out. Listen, I didn't say it, but I told you this is one of my favorite benedictions. Did you see that in verse 20? Yeah. That he brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant. Through the blood of the eternal covenant he brought. Even Jesus our Lord was the sacrifice of that covenant. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this in the Old Testament, but you know, God made a covenant with Abraham and he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. a covenant was like entering into a contract that it was so severe, so, so, um, what's the right word? Holy, Se holy and serious. Mm -hmm. Not to be taken lightly. They would actually take live animals and cut them in half this way, asunder from, you know, the middle of the body, split it this way. And they would lay the two halves, one on each side, and they would speak the words of whatever covenant that they were gonna enter into. Uh, make a covenant with my brother here that, that this land from this tree over to that spot over there, over that, is gonna belong to him, and this over here is gonna be mine, and, and, and we're not gonna, you know, steal from each other because there's a curse if you take from another man his the boundary move the boundary it says in the in the proverbs don't move the boundary there'll be a curse to you and so we're going to make this covenant that this is the division of this property and we're we're entering into this pact so to speak. that's kind of the word they use in here but we're, we're making this contract and and to show you how serious we are we're now going to walk together side by side through the parted pieces of these dead of this dead animal it's been sawn asunder and as we walk through may it be done unto us as has happened to this animal if we would break these words that was the idea of a blood covenant just so you know and you might remember that abraham god made a covenant with him he's going to multiply him as numerous as any and he but it says he put him to to sleep he he made a covenant he spoke the words and he said and then a great sleep came over him and he didn't the bible says he didn't walk through but god's spirit passed through like a whirling fire consuming the the animals and he didn't just do one animal he had multiple animals asunder which was like heavy duty covenant i mean mm -hmm. may it be done to us as like done to all these animals if we break this and, and god didn't let abraham walk through instead he walked through and, and let him sleep. And God went, I'm the one that's going to keep it. Amen. My Amen. word, not you. I'm not really, I, I don't depend on you guys. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like God going, you know, you are but dust and I'm mindful that you're but dust. So um, I'm not really counting on your dust to perform here. I'll do it. <laughs> but And God passed through, right? You remember that story? Amen. God is the one who says, I'm the one that did the covenant. You just rest. And um, that's, kind of, that's a kind of cool thing if you think about it. God just wants us to rest, not, yes, oh, and, uh, and, and he, wa he wants us to rest and not be stressed about it. Well, this is what he did for us. Through the blood of who? The, of Jesus, the great shepherd. You know, we just sang that Psalm 95 this morning because I wanted to remind you, we're just the sheep of his hand. He's the great shepherd. The great shepherd of, of the sheep. It, I like it when my Italian Bible makes that part. All the articles and stuff, they don't actually are arranged in English in the same order as they are in my Italian Bible. So this is actually at the end of the sentence. The great shepherd of the sheep is uh, at the end. And it's like a punctuation. It's like, he's the one who's looking out for me. I'm just the sheep of his hand. Ah, it's so nice. You know, I... I I guess because when I was young, I had to memorize Psalm 23. I don't know if any of you guys had to learn, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Right? He maketh me to lie down in green 
green pastures, he restores my soul. Leads me beside the still waters, right? He, he, you, right, you guys know that one, right? Yea, though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for, why? Thou art with me. Oh man, the, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You know, the Lord is, well, when I think about that song, and how the Lord guide, has guided my life. You know, some people say, you know, you, you really count on God to guide you, don't you? I'm like, man, I couldn't do it without His guidance. I don't know about you guys. I, I, I'd be lost. Without the, without the gift of, of God's Spirit and to lead us and to guide us, forget it, man. I'd be just floundering trying to figure out what do I do today, you know? And I could make a plan, work the plan, do the plan, and at the end of the plan, I'd be going... You know, was that really what I was supposed to do? That, that's a that's an odd feeling that when you, you put in so much... I mean, I've met men that have spent their entire lives working their plans. Yep. And, and, and they've confessed, maybe even on their deathbed, you know, I worked my plan my whole life and I feel like it's empty. Yeah. It's a kind of weird thing. They would say, after doing all these achievements and I gained all this, you know, I built a business empire, I built wealth, I, I got my yacht, I got my... Toys, I got all this stuff, and it's yet there's something missing. I feel empty, and I'm like, it's because you didn't let God equip you to do His will. You just used whatever God-given gifts you had and did your own will. And the men doing their own will, it's an emptiness. It's a well, Solomon wrote it in the book of Ecclesiastes: vanity, vanity, all is vanity. It's all emptiness. You know, when when you do all this stuff and do all your work under the sun, and you and you don't do it for your maker, well, then you're not really doing anything of value in, in eternity. That's why it has an empty feeling. It doesn't carry an eternal weight with it. And if you want the, you want it to feel like something that matters, well, then you got to be busy doing, like Jesus. He said, I, I don't do my own will. I don't, I don't even say what I want to say. He said, I only say the things which I hear the Father say. Only do the things what the Father wants me to do. He's my example, by the way. He's the one I copy. Amen. I want to be like him. I want to be like, I, literally, if I could impart that and say, you know, I only tried to do what God wanted me to do. Every day. Just wake up, Lord. I just want to do what you want me to do. If I'm not supposed to do this, help me know to turn away from that and focus on whatever it is you want me to do. Because I have found in his divine wisdom and knowledge, he might appoint me to do something and I don't even understand why. I mean, he'd be like, you go help that person fix their, their backyard. And I'm like, what? Yep, get it over there and pull their weeds. And I'm like, I, you know, okay. Hey, I, I mean, I'm thinking, uh, this is boring, you know. Lord, what, what eternal value does this have, you know? And, and, and then the hoe I'm using breaks. Now I got to go to the store and get them a new hoe. And, you know, it wasn't even, it was a piece of junk hoe that I was using. And the Lord goes, just, you just, and then I go to the store to get him a hoe. And God has a divine appointment with the cashier when I'm getting the hoe. I'm like, yeah, I'm getting this hoe because I was helping this person. The thing broke. And why were you helping the person? Well, God says, you know, if you want to be great in his kingdom, learn to be a servant of all and trying to stack up some treasure. And, really? You really believe in heaven? Yeah, I sure do. Don't you? And then it turns to the opportunity Amen. that I would have not had because I would have never gone to that store to get a hoe and talk to that cashier because... God just said, go serve over here. Some simple thing. You know, sometimes in our service, we don't even understand what God is working. We don't know the divine work that he's at. And he might just be working on you inside. I remember you, one of my first assignments was helping one of the widows in church in Calvary Chapel Cottonwood. They're in the Verde Valley. And the, 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 the youth pastor, Bill Elander, or assistant pastor, whatever title you want to give him, he just took care of us kids in the youth group and He's like, it is, we gotta go help this widow. I'm like, we do? Says, yeah, God is a champion for the widows and the orphans, you know, and you wanna be blessed. He's a never curse a widow, never curse an orphan, ever. God will get, God will take it up with you. Don't do that. And so he was teaching me this. And he said, we wanna get a great blessing from God. Let's go help this widow. And we went to her house, a little teeny house, there in Clarkdale, Arizona, and it was, it was like vines growing all, uh, weed vines, like junk stuff and a lot of stickers and spiky stuff. And, and, and there in the desert, it had grown up along the edge of her house and the trash had 
you know, blown the wind, blown it into there, and it's like trash stuck into the weeds, and and and, and then there was her trash cans that she couldn't get out to take care of the trash. Back in those days, we would, we would take the trash and put it in the metal can and burn it on the day when it's allowed to burn. You know, we burn the trash and trash hadn't been burned and it had piled up and it had blown, you know, then the coyotes got into it and ripped it and drug it all around and so her whole backyard is full of trash and weeds and tumbleweeds, you know, and I'm just like, what are we doing here? She said, we're learning to be great. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. We're going we're gonna to serve here. And he wasn't kidding, man. We were going to we were going to clean all that trash up, all those weeds, pull all that vine down. And then, I think we're just about done. And he goes, nope, this front porch needs painting. It's bad. Look at that. So then we had to sit there with a the wire brush and scrub all the old flaky paint off and then repaint the whole thing. And this has turned into like a week or two of constant work on this lady's house. And I, I thought, what are we doing here? I had no idea God was working on me. Because I thought my agenda was so important and I didn't know about serving others. Jesus said it. I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. You want to be great, Mikey? You guys, here, let me, I'm the master. You call me master, right? They were at the, at the, remember at the last supper, they're at the table? And they were down there arguing which one of them was the greatest. So Jesus is going to give an object lesson a, while they're having a little discussion of who's the greatest. And he says, excuse me, guys, while you're fighting down there. Who's the greatest? To, who's the Lord here? Who's the master? You know, like, attention, you 12 goofballs, you know. They're down there fighting us. I'm greater. I'm No, I'm greater. I'm the, you know? And Jesus gets up and he takes off his robe and he puts a towel around his waist and girds himself. And, and he gets a basin of water and then he began to wash their feet. That, that is the lowliest job of a servant in that day. And he goes to Peter, and Peter's like, no, Lord, you don't wash my feet, you know. And So I don't wash your feet. You, I have no part with you. And he goes, okay, okay, wash all of me. He goes, nope, wash your feet. That's why he needs. <laughs> washes his feet. And he washes all their feet, and then he says to them, now, if I'm the master, and I just washed your feet, I just did the lowliest of lowly. Think about this. They were walking around in maybe leather slippers, you know, with with with, with little in, on dirt roads. There was no paved roads. I mean, Rome had made some influence and made some rocky cobble, but still, you know, walking on the roadway and then the, from from and there was no paved roads between cities. They were walking on dirt. You go pound that dirt for twenty miles and come in, and your feet are nasty. And he, Jesus is there washing their feet. He says, now if I, I'm the master and I do this for you, what should you do for one another? Object lesson punctuated. You think you're so great? Have you served anybody today? Have you done the lowly job of you know, picking up the nasty trash that was rotted and foul and festering and you know, taking care of it for the widow? Or, hey, God was... I'm telling you, working on me. I didn't, I didn't sign up for Jesus to do all this menial, nasty work. I mean, I, what, what is, you know? He's like, yeah, but you don't have your priorities straight. Yeah. It's so funny because Jesus said, whatever you do to the least of my brethren, you even give them a cup of water in my name. He says, like you did it to me. And what does he say about that? He says, he will reward you for everything you've done. So when we do those things in service to others, God says, cha-ching, put that down, eternal eternal reward coming for you for that. You know, you, you may get nothing down here. I don't want you to get the mindset of doing things for people down here so that you can get things down here. It does. That's not what the goal is. I want you to do what Jesus said. He says, store up for yourself treasure in heaven where moth and rust doesn't destroy. Thieves do not break in and steal. Put your treasures up there. Because he says, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. I want you to get your heart so bound in heavenly things that you look forward to heaven, not fear going to heaven. And the only way you can really get that understanding is 
you know, well, once you serve for a while, you start realizing I'm not, I'm not banking down here. I'm mm -hmm. I'm banking upstairs. I'm putting yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm putting in some some treasure for fut my future. Yeah. You know, yeah. when I get and I, I guys, I'm going to tell you this. There was a there was a gentleman I very close to my early Christian walk, and he used to say to me, "Well, who cares about heavenly treasure? As long as I get saved, that's good enough." You know, I just I just I, I just signed up for Jesus to to get salvation, you know, like Jesus Christ mutual. Like he's fire insurance, eternal fire insurance. I just I just signed up so I get the policy and make sure I don't burn in hell. But but I don't even care if I have any treasure. What do I need treasure for when I'm up there? And I said, Well, because Jesus said to store it up there. And you know he was one of the laziest Christians I ever met. He was. He was just why should I do anything? I, as long as I'm saved, I'm good. I'm like, you are the like trying to squeak in with the least amount of do anything. You, you know the problem was that he didn't see any value and God's equipping him to do good works for God's will. Because all he cared about was saving his own hiding. And I was like, this is bad. This attitude is wrong. Whenever you lose sight of eternal treasure that's coming, eternal reward, you lose sight of that someday you're going to stand before your maker and give an account to him of everything that you did down here. You get spiritually lazy. You, 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 don't, you don't even perceive like Moses when he wrote Psalm 90. He said, if I live 70, 80 years due to strength, my life is but a vapor. And then I fly away. That's where we get the song, I'll fly away. But he goes on that's uh, Psalm 90, 10. And then verse 11 and 12, he tells us, So teach me to number my days, that I might present to thee a heart full of wisdom. In the, in the Hebrew, it's literally, teach me to, to make a full accounting. It's an accounting term. Filling in the whole day with all of the work that I did. So I can say, here's my ledger. I did this to please you. I, I, I made the most of the, you know, and this is, by the way, when you, whenever I teach people that you're going to stand before God and give an accounting, mm -hmm. it's kind of sobering, you know, it makes you think, am I, am I spending my day correctly? Mm -hmm. You know, am I just wasting it or am I investing it? Because the, the longer I've known the Lord, the more I think, I don't have that many. You know, I can tell, you know, time passes quicker, it seems like as I got older. Yeah. And I, I don't seem to get as much done. And I wanna, I wanna invest a lot. I, I, I wanna, I wanna bank a lot upstairs, and it's almost like, man, I, time is short. It seems shorter than ever. How much investing can I get done? I, I gotta, I really gotta make the most of every day. I gotta bank as much as I can. But I have to realize that I can't do it unless I recognize that it's not about my will. It really comes down to not my will, but Thy will be done. Now. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, did he happen to throw that in? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and whose will be done? Oh, oh wait, in the first line. Yeah, yeah, that's it. The Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, and whose will? Thy will be done. We better switch this back to thy will. And that's why I say this is one of my all-time favorite benedictions, because he's praying a blessing over you that you would be equipped by the God of peace that already arranged all your salvation through the eternal blood of the great shepherd who he raised from the dead, even the shepherd of us sheep. Amen. He made a covenant through the blood with us, his son's blood, so that he could equip us in every good thing to do his will. His will. Oh, thank you, Lord, for doing that. And, and now as he blesses, that you would understand God is working in you. God is at work in you to do that which is pleasing in His sight through His Son, Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory de secoli, that forever and ever, that's Italian, secoli de secoli, forever and ever. Amen. This has got eternal consequences. Forever and ever. That counts for 
a long time. See, some people don't put that into the blessing. They don't get this. This work that he's equipped you to do is for his glory for how long? Forever, Forever mm -hmm. and ever. Don't downplay how much that treasure is going to be worth. Because whatever treasures you store up there, you get to keep forever and ever. Now, I see a value in storing up. And that's the benediction. Now, I, you know, for fun, I'd love to take you time would allow, you know, to all the, some of my other favorites, you know, mm -hmm. Second Timothy, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, well, the First Timothy's good too, but <laughs> actually, there's a bunch that are really good. James. <laughs> well, I, I'm thinking of the ones that Paul, I, I do tend to, to weight this letter as heavily influenced by Paul. And, and, and but I don't have proof. I can't. Don't say, Pastor Izzy says this is written by Paul. No, the church historians thought it was, and they grouped it in the grouping with Paul's letters. It's the last at the end of Paul's letters, so I can kind of think, yeah, it's pretty good, you know. <laughs> but when I think of like Second Corinthians, the end of it, he says, uh, "Finally, brethren, rejoice! Be made complete. Mm -hmm. Be comforted. Be like-minded. Live in peace." And the God of love and the God of peace shall be with you. Greet one another, he says, with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus. I remember, I told you, he always puts the grace of the Lord. Be with you with the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Be with you all. Someone actually, you know, when I was a young believer, they said, I don't believe in the Trinity. I said, you ever read Corinthians in the Bible? They said, what's that have to do with anything? He said, well, I'm pretty sure Paul, the apostle, uh, held to the fact that there's a triune dimension to God. They said, what are you talking about? I said, I, I don't think he paid attention to the end. So I read him this verse again. I said, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Why would he break it down into the grace of the Lord the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit if there is not those dimensions to this almighty being. I submit to you, Paul probably held to an idea that there was many components to God in the way he's revealed himself. You know, and whether you want to use the word Trinity, because they were like, the word Trinity is not used in the Bible. I said, absolutely, you're right. That ruined their whole argument. That was going to be their argument. That the word is not used in the Bible. You're right. The idea that there's a triune God is from the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Read it in, in Hebrew. Elohim. Elohim in Hebrew, him is the ending that means three parts in one. It's not like our English where we have just I singular. Us can be you and me, two people. Or us can be a bunch of us. Or them. They, but in Hebrew they have a designation. Elohai, uh, Elohai is for God Himself, singular, Most High. Elohim is for triune, three parts. There's a part what is two. We don't actually have it used because we don't have Him as two parts. So they only in the Scripture have Him as God Most High and God in a triune plural. Who's it talking about? Elohim, three parts, made all these things which are seen out of what was unseen. And it describes the, the conversation as they discussed making the things. Let us make man in what? God had made man after his pattern. Well, anyway, I'm not here to argue about Trinity. I just want you to know we've got a really big God. Amen. who sent his son who his son gave us his Holy Spirit so they're all three parts are available Amen. but you know what it comes back to that thing I said at the beginning if you want it it's offered to you what do you have to do you got to receive it and some people just can't receive they're terrible receivers you know you offer them something they go oh no no I can't take that I can't take nothing you know okay. what do I got to do to earn it nothing I'm giving it to you I'd like to give you this that you could go from here today thinking about eternal things that are going to last forever and ever. 
and all the things that you're going to lay up in in heaven, you think, what did, what what do I have to achieve to to, to do it? Really, you just got to follow him, and you got to learn to to maybe pray the prayer that Jesus prayed, Father, not my will, but Thy will be done. Take that away with you today, and you'll find out that you He'll equip you with everything you need. That's not that's not your problem. He's the equipper, not you. It says right here, the guy who made the covenant in the blood of his son, and he's the one that passed through, by the way. I'm sure we didn't go through between the carcasses to be part of that whole covenant thing. I mean, the very words of the, here, the blood covenant, are the same idea that was transmitted in the Old Testament to teach us how serious this is, how holy this contract is, and how much God takes it to, to, to importance. Now, it's that important to him. And he's called the God of peace. That made the covenant in his son. That equips you for every good work. You don't have to worry about it. He does all the, he does all the heavy lifting. And then he gives you a little part. It's kind of like a dad going, here, son, help me. And he's carrying the big beam by himself. And the kid's at the end with his hand on it. And he's like, good job, son. Keep helping. <laughs> you know? He wants us to be part of what he's doing. But he does all the heavy lifting. I got news for you. It's not us. The longer you're in the Lord, the more you start seeing. Wow, he he divinely orchestrated that meeting. He divinely set up that appointment. He made that thing happen or that miracle work out this way. You can start to perceive, you know, maybe I'm not doing all the heavy lifting here. But it's a grand thing to be part of what he's doing. I'll still put my hand on the end of the board and be happy to carry it along. You know? Let me be do any part, Lord. Let me be part of your will. Witness. I just want to do that. Well, that's the benediction he gives. And, of course, he ends with the grace of the Lord. Yes. Be with you all. God's grace be with you. You Just for extra credit, you want, just start at the book of Romans. There's only there's only 12 books that follow. And then thir 13th one is Hebrews here. You already know that benediction. So you only got 12. I'm going to give you a dozen, a do a, just a dozen Benedictions. You only got to read the last paragraph of each of the books for extra credit. You want to see, and, and and you see if the grace is in there. Now, one of them is tucked a little bit higher up. You're going to have to back up a few verses to see it. It's um, it's not right at the very last line. It's up a little higher. So some someone's going to come to you. It's not in all of them. Yes, it is. Just back up a little. You know. Okay. Maybe read the last couple paragraphs of each letter for extra credit, and you'll see it. And then you'll see some other things. Maybe you'll see some things that will build up your faith this week. I know that for me, I did that just for a good faith encouragement. I just read all of the benedictions from Romans all the way through Hebrews. And I was like, man, these are juicy. I could do, I could do a whole series on these. You know, the thing, the blessings God wants to bless you with. Ephesians 3, 4. You know, yeah, some sweet ones. Oh, you'll love it. Anyway, that's just for extra credit for fun tonight. You can do that or during this week. Maybe break it down. Just do one, a, one a, or two a day, you know, and look at the ends of each of the letters. But think of them as a blessing being spoken because that's how they were actually written. They're not written just like, in conclusion, yeah. no. <laughs> in blessing you with the greatest of blessings. I remember Pastor Chuck, he used to use the blessing of Aaron. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. And may he give you what? Do you guys know the end of that? From the blessing? May he give you peace. May the God of peace give you peace this week. As he just gives, as only he can, the things that he wants to equip you with. So that's what I have for you this week. Next week I'm going to do a psalm with you. Um, uh, you know, my reading, I was doing the psalms. And uh, one of the psalms just, just stuck off the, you know how sometimes certain things stick out to you. So we're going to do Psalm 78 next week. If you want to read ahead, it's a little, it, it, it's a psalm recounting the great things that God does. And we want to focus on Him, not on us. That kind of gives our attention the right focus for this life. So so next week, that's just to give you a heads up. Uh, we're going to be jumping to a psalm. And then uh, I, I got a couple of the psalms that I think might be uh, like the right, I always want the right word at the right time. And there's some people struggling right now with just depression and and feeling, you know, like um, not a lot of hope. And um, there's some words in the Psalms that are greatly comforting. So 
I think we might do a couple psalms before we go back to another of the epistles. chapter. And I'm praying about doing one of Paul's, uh, one of his um, pastoral epistles. Um, for the guys that want to do ministry, he writes some words to Timothy that are powerful. And also some of his prison epistles. There's some, some really powerful words in them too. So I'm just, uh, if you have a book you'd like to learn about, you can type it in the comments below. Uh, those of you watching online, you want to learn a certain book of the Bible. I like to go chapter by chapter, verse by verse. It, uh, it's just a safeguard. I, I just teach you the whole counsel of God. And, um, so, so we'll be doing that. But, but next week, if you don't mind, read that psalm and just get ready for next week. And um, we'll be uh, which in, psalm? In, in, enjoy that. Psalm seventy. I said it right. Psalm seventy-eight mm -hmm. is uh, the psalm that I'd like to jump to. Just, just to that one because of. It's just a, it's a recounting of the glory of the Lord, what He did, you know, and sometimes we just, uh, and, and, and um, uh, oh, you know what, there's another one that I was also praying about, it's Psalm 107, okay, just so you know, I, both of them are a fair game. I'm, I'll, I'll tell you what, read them both, extra credit, and, I, 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 and I'll, I'll seek the Lord and decide what, what part will be the best word for next week, you know. Psalm 107 and Psalm 78, just they're both just to... Just for building up your faith, you know, and uh, but they have different different emphasis. So I'll just have to ask the Lord which one. I, I well, I won't say. I'll just seek the Lord. I've got time. I got a whole week, and uh, can't lie and say I don't know them yet. So I might have taught it before. Anyway, blessings to you, all you guys that are watching online. Linda, blessings to you, dear sister. Aloha from Kona, and uh, love from all of the brethren here. For you, Glenn, that watching, blessings to you guys. And look forward to, uh, to sharing with you next week if the Lord tarries. May the Lord bless you, may He keep you, and may He make His face to shine upon you. And may He give you peace as you go through this week. Blessings and aloha. Share this with somebody if you know it would bless them. And, and help me, guys, because I can't do all that part. I'm, I, I'm doing good just to teach and preach and do the worship and... And I just the social media part is not my strong suit, but there's some of you really good at it. If you don't mind sharing it to somebody that could use a, a, a pick me up in their day, I'd love it if you'd help me out in that way. So blessings from Kona, aloha. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.